Live from CUBE headquarters in Palo Alto, California, it's the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Hey, welcome to our Silicon Valley Friday Show. We're a special broadcast here at the Grace Hopper. We're recording, it's not Friday, it's Thursday. Tomorrow's Friday, we're not in Palo Alto. We're in Houston, Texas for the Grace Hopper celebration. This is the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. And, and the guests here are the good fellows. The fellowship from the Tech Truth um, is really a, been a big, amazing opportunity for everyone here at the show, as well as Silicon Angle, as well as the Ground Truth Project. Uh, Tori Puja and Karis, welcome to joining me today. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us. Thanks for having so us. So you guys are young, next generation, the young guns, I say, the next generation journalism, part of the Tech Truth Fellowship, which is a combination of a project between SiliconANGLE Media, my company, and Charlie Sennett's project, Ground Truth Project, which is going into a tech area to take the ground truth principles and bringing it into the technology realm, which is super exciting, and you get to kind of have fun in the cube here and on the ground, so it's been great, so thanks so much for coming on. I got to get your, your take, though, because you guys I look at as you know, the next generation minds that are going to create the future. And Alan Kay, uh, famous technologist, once said, if you want, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And so you guys are out there going to be inventing the future. I mean, you see the debate last night we saw, it was horrible. Just a state of the politics is kind of representative of the culture of the country. And we're here at the Grace Hopper where women in tech, we're talking about culture, about women in tech, the numbers aren't big enough, diversity, pay, uh, gender, all this stuff. It's an arc, and they got the internet, right? You got offensive gamer gate, you have, I mean, we are in a generational shift where I'm going to be dead before hope you, this gets solved. So you guys have to solve the problems. So, I mean, this is a <laughs> huge problem out <laughs> there. <laughs> and yeah, you got to solve it. <laughs> you guys have to make, <laughs> <laughs> No, but this is a problem. This is first generation. There's no rules. So it's a wild, wild west. You're seeing, you know, obviously it's, you know, obviously politicians having, you know, sex tapes now and, you know, debates that look more like a cage match from reality TV that was fiction. It's just ridiculous, but this is a state of the culture, the media culture. Race as a culture. I, I think that that, uh, that could be a direction towards a more sexually liberated culture, and perhaps we could move away from this entire focus we have on people's sexual history, unless of course it's, we're talking about sexual harassment, which is very serious, but you know, we, we really, this could be a wonderful time for us to be discussing policy, and I feel like there's a lot of really sensationalist Coverage. So just get it out on the table. Just be transparent. One thing about the culture too is that we're really surfacing a lot of really ugly stuff, which I don't think has been invented through this election. I think it's it's being surfaced. I think it already existed in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so now kind of the other half is learning about. Is it new rules or it's just like people just now are so sensationalized. I mean, it was, you know, you can talk about other presidents and politics and there's always been kind of uh, affairs and things that w went on, but there was kind of the unwritten rules, don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Trump is bringing it all out and I think it's, it's a question of, you know, he'll say things that are very sensationalist and very racially charged and really offensive and it will bring out other people that agree with him that people that hadn't been, hadn't had a platform to speak before. And, mm -hmm. you know, if Hillary Clinton is elected, there's going to be a ton of backlash against her just based on her gender. But that isn't something that doesn't already exist. That's just going to be unearthed through her being president. Yeah, and she's taken a lot of heat over the years too. I mean, she's kind of has battle scars, if you will, just kind of pioneering the role. I mean, if she will probably be elected. I mean, it's pretty much going to, my opinion, unless some sort of Brexit kind of weird thing happens. Yeah, statistically, <laughs> it seems pretty likely. It looks, yeah. 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 <laughs> Certainly after last night, it doesn't look like he's got any chance. And again, unless there's some sort of Brexit kind of phenomenon going on in this country that we don't know about, that is a blind spot where, you know, some people come out of the woodwork that have never voted before in droves, and the polling yeah. could be, I mean, that's mm -hmm. the only reason I could think of that. But could, I actually think that Brexit, yeah. a lot of people said that was kind of like, Amer a lot of, for a lot of Americans, that was their wake up call because, um, you know, if there were a lot of people who didn't vote and then there, you saw a higher turnout amongst um, older people and people who are more conservative, which kind of swung the vote. And so I think that a lot of um, uh, maybe younger people who feel more apathetic about voting um, saw that and they're like, wow, if I don't put my voice out there, this is what could happen. So I actually think Brexit sort of came at a convenient time. I mean, time will tell, but um, I, th I think that there's, and I also think, you know, between like this election and, and Bre like if Brexit had been a, like a political campaign with like months and months and months of coverage, I don't know if it would have ended up the same way. It was sort of like this one issue vote that mm -hmm. um, sort of really polarized people. But I think here, like Trump has found a way to disenfranchise literally everyone except for 
white men, you know, yeah. who are rich yeah. and also, you know, don't care about like. Well, women. and also so, I mean, some say just, he's got the working class, some of the blue collar men as well, because yeah. they feel screwed because you know they're in mean, the middle class seems to be suffering. At least some say that. I'm not a yeah. political commentator, but that's my observation. Absolutely. Certainly, he lost the women vote. I mean, he kills the women vote, but. Um, well, and that's 50% of the country. So, yeah. I mean, you look at it right there, I mean, it's yeah, gone. That's, and yeah. so I think that's what's, like, really important to remember is, like, these. this is literally half of the country that yeah. is, is being disenfranchised. But well, we're going to talk here. in our segment called Thinking Out Loud where we're going to riff on this, and we're going to talk about some comments that Virginia Heffernan made with her book Art and Magic, which she said, she's taking a step back and saying, hey, let's look at what's happening as a generational thing, as a movement, um, and it's art and uh, art and magic at the same time. So these magical things are happening. You mentioned this might be a great opportunity. There's some magic potentially in there, but it's artistic. The web is can be angry, and that's art can be angry. So we're going to talk about that because I want to get your generational view because what's offensive, what's not, you know, what's kind of on the underbelly of the internet, as it used to have been called, was the, these user groups. It was a lot of hate talk and a lot of people hiding behind avatars. What's really interesting is that we can have this conversation kind of theoretically about what is offensive, whereas, you know, as a woman, and I'm a white woman, so it re I'm really not experiencing all of these feelings, but if you are a person of color or a woman or a person who is in a group that's been discriminated against, you feel really affected by these comments because we're talking so much in this election now about sexual assault and we're talking about sexual harassment and we're talking about rape and we're talking about abortion in an extremely graphic way. And I think if you're a woman, well, if you're a woman who's experienced any of those things, it's intensely personal and affects you in a very deep emotional level. And if you're a woman who hasn't experienced any of those things, it still does because you feel like a much more marginalized group and you feel like you are an other and you feel like this is not that that the fact that we can just open all these things up and repeat them and and you know rip the scabs off over yeah. and over again it's really hurtful so i think it's one thing for us to sit around and talk about just talk about these issues as issues but they really personally affect people and i think this election has been really hard for a lot of yeah. people who love yeah. to follow politics they can't follow it as much because it hurts yeah. so personally you guys have some thoughts oh. on that um, Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I was going to say that I've been comparing this election to Gamergate a lot, just in the sense of, I mean, Trump's comments are offending a lot of people, but it's also starting a conversation that, as Tori mentioned, that these problems have existed for a while. You know, politics has been sexist. Politics has been misogynistic. I think I've ever since this election started, I've been reading so many articles about how women on average get interrupted so much more often. So there are bigger issues and there are smaller issues, but they're being brought to the forefront. And I think in a similar way in the technology space that's what Gamergate did where women were being harassed for years in the gaming world but Gamergate was just so absolutely horrible because women were driven out of their houses they were getting violent death threats and I think it took something that bad for people to realize that this was a wake-up call that we can't have an industry that's so popular that exists in this way and in a similar sense we can't have politics that exists you know in this space like we yeah. can't have and the medium for, amplifies it too like Gamergate if you had people in a room in a party there'd be a brawl probably and people might not say some things they're hiding behind some internet avatar it's interesting to see that that happen because you know to me I look at this as interesting is like you know I, in every, we cover innovation at SiliconANGLE, so one of the things we always look for is innovation opportunities where there's massive disruption mm -hmm. that creates value at, at many levels. And in the 60s, it was a real counterculture that spawned a bunch of new things. Revolution of the computer revolution really started in the 60s. And so the 60s movement was an interesting time in the technology industry. So I'm wondering if you guys see this time as a potential counterculture opportunity because Everyone's been connected. I mean, you know, we joke on theCUBE that this is, you know, my kids are first generation all access porn on the internet, all access to, um, you know, these, the, um, the, all the visible signs of everything. So like, you know, we didn't have that, we had no cell phones when I was growing up. So there was all different worlds. So like the conversations, how we worked as groups changed. It was a completely different norms and, and dynamics. The interaction of tech and politics is really interesting in this election, particularly if you're familiar with the Never Trump app, there's an app where you can uh, connect to your social networks and say who you're voting for. So if you really love Gary Johnson and you're living in Ohio um, and you go on the Never Trump app and you look for, because your ultimate goal is to not get Trump elected. And so you go on the app and it will connect you with your social networks. It will connect you with me. Um, I live in Massachusetts. or. No, you love Gary Johnson, you live in Ohio, I live in I'm Massachusetts, and so you say, hey, like, 
if you vote for Gary Johnson, I'll vote for Hillary Clinton. And if we both don't want Trump elected, that's a, a use of so technology. So gamification for right. driving a viral turnout. Right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, we're going to come in more of this. We're going to continue the next segment. It's kind of like we're kind of going it right at it. It's great. The impact of the next generation, the next generation we're going to get into more of your, your assignments, digging into journalism for the next generation. What does that mean? Um, how, what is the future that needs to be invented? Because it's going to come from you guys and you know, my kids and their generation. And certainly we can help that. But we're going to get into that in a deep way and find out what the younger generation thinks of all this madness, the art, the magic, the madness. If I was going to add it to her book, it would be Art, Magic, and Madness, because I think there's a lot of madness in there. We'll be back with more here on Silicon Valley Fridays with John Furrier. With the, we're with the fellows here at Grace Hopper. Since the dawn of big data, the Cube has been there. Connecting with executives, practitioners, entrepreneurs, thought leaders. But you're not a thought leader anymore, you're a futurist. That's the new trend. Futurist is the buzzword. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm very much living in the past. <laughs> I don't like the future. And I don't think much of the present. And John Cleese. <laughs> There's a whole lot of people out there who have no idea what they're doing, but they have absolutely no idea that they have no idea what they're doing. And those are the ones with the confidence of stupidity who finish up in power. That's why the planet doesn't work. Knowledgeable, insightful, and a true gentleman. And the guy at the counter recognized me and said, are you listening? Yes, I'm tweeting away. So you're not I tweet, tweet. I'm tweeting away. He just got kind of rude that way. But. keyboard. <laughs> John Cleese joins the Cube alumni. Welcome, John. You got any phone calls you need to answer? Hold on, let me check. The Cube is a comfortable place. You come inside the Cube and we have a conversation, uh, almost as if it were a, a, a chance meeting. And we have a, a discussion about a particular topic. Our philosophy is everybody's expert at something. Everybody's passionate about something and has real deep knowledge about that something. Well, we want to focus in on that area and extract that knowledge and share it with our communities. Folks who have never heard of it before come in the Cube and say, wow, this is really cool what you guys are doing. It's unique, it adds value to the community, and it adds value by really sharing information. I can't tell you how many people stop me at conferences or on the streets, on our airports, say, hey, I love your show. People that I've never met before, they say to me, I know you, you don't know me. I watch the Cube, I queue up your videos, I listen to them while I'm on the, the treadmill. You know, it helps me, you know, learn, expands my knowledge, you know, thank you. So, you know, it's really an honor to be part of that community. This is Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching The Cube. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Hey, we're back. I'm John Furrier with Silicon Valley Friday, special broadcast here on Thursday, not in Silicon Valley, but in Houston, Texas with the Grace Hopper Celebration in Computing. I'm with the fellows from the Tech Truth, the partnership between the Ground Truth and Silicon Angle Media. Um, continuing the conversation around the next generation, you guys are uh, distinguished fellows uh, in journalism. What is going on? With, is, is journalism dead? And what is journalism? <laughs> are there any jobs out there? Why, you know, all the old guys are getting fired. They're too expensive. I got to get the page uh, views. Yeah. I need more banner ads. You know, basically work for nothing. Is there jobs out there? What's going on? Are you asking us to solve the problem of how to monetize <laughs> the current journalism industry? No, I mean, what, what's going on with journalism? If, if, if money is not being made, mm. people can't afford, that's why we do the fellowship, but in general, is journalism changing? Obviously, I think, you know, I always kind of look at it, journalism and reporting. You're out reporting, you're doing stuff, trust is a big thing, but like, there's still a need for journalism, especially now more than ever. I think there will always be a need for people to know what's going on in the world and for people to know the truth. And I think that the medium is going to change a lot. I don't know that newspapers made of trees will be around forever, but I think definitely people will want verified, trustworthy information, and I only hope that we can carry our standards of ethics into that. Yeah, one of the things I like about the election this time, really kind of innovated this whole fact-checking real time. Um, annotations I thought was phenomenal addition to, to yeah. the publishing side of things. I think that's a really important thing to point out because I don't necessarily know if we're going to have the same time, time schedule of news as, as we have in the past. Like, like you're saying, it won't be like a morning newspaper or you know an mm -hmm. afternoon edition or something like that. It's that people know that they just, if they want verification, has to be in real time. It has to be um, you know delivered to them. So I mean, NPR's um, live blog fact checking, I think is like a very valuable way of doing journalism that's maybe not in the traditional sense 
case you find a stir you find a story you report on it you know you you do you put it out for the sunday edition and then you're over with it it's that you have to meet people where they are and the fact of the matter is the audience is online now the audience is on social media they were there it's the net or the um the Netflix, the live stream uh, generation. So it's like people, you need to go where they're watching it and that's happening. Karis, that's time. a great point. The NPR thing is a total innovation, in my opinion. That is like amazing, because it's real time. They're getting content out fast with facts. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of crowdsourcing it too. They're using different sources. So that brings up the next kind of topic, which is like, how do you get sources? How do you get out stuff fast? Because people want stuff fast now. It's real time. There's competition on Twitter. Twitter's like a, you know, one big communication, you know, backbone of instant access. You know, there's access to information, but what's real, what's not? I mean, it's comes back down to verification. Uh, yeah, so that's a real challenge. I mean, I, I just have to be frank about it. It's like, you're, you're as a journalist, especially someone, I work in digital media, so we are constantly fighting against the clock. Um, and there, there's just times where it breaks down. You know, I mean, that's, and, but the, the difference is that people don't care as much anymore. You know, and I don't know if they ever really did, and they just, we had these um, holds in place that made sure that we delivered people fact check news. But nowadays, people are just, they just want to see the headline. They just want to know, um, they just want to be able to see the headline, see the tweet, be able to talk to someone about it like within that second and then kind of forget about it and so I though I think there's there's it's still really it's important interesting to I was talking check. to Jeff Frick about this it's like it's, like it, it's almost become this almost um, you get kind of bored of like some of the content it used to be like okay the trusted source was the like, New York Times and the magazine they were on the third they were watching the, the people in power and I trusted them because I don't have access mm -hmm. they do I don't now I, everyone has access. I so. disagree with you and I agree with you mm -hmm. on the two separate things that you said. I think that people really do still want trustworthy news sources and I think that's really important. Like and who? I, well, I think that we're in a, in a time when everything that's published is really... Yeah. not trusted it's really not trusted and it needs to be and it's and it's probably more trustworthy than it's ever been because it's so easy to fact check now it's so much easier to like immediately you can't get away with plagiarism you can't get away with lying you're going to get called that's out that's assuming people you're are, are get, watching and you're going to get yeah. just just so embarrassed publicly for it as well. So I really think we're in a very, like journalism is much more trustworthy than it's been before, but people are m much less trusting. But I also think it, what you said about being able to do like a post-mortem and talk about things, we don't do that as much anymore. We don't analyze stuff as much anymore. We don't talk about when there's a story, you're right, it goes out, we see it, we kind of digest it in the moment and then we're, then we're done. And we could do, I think we could really use a lot more like anal analysis yeah, of but things. what I think is, I mean, but in terms of like people trusting things, literally half the country doesn't trust the New York Times anymore because they believe they have a liberal bent. So it doesn't matter whether people yeah. are fact checking it because if they don't believe that the source is someone who believes the same thing they do, then like they're not, they, they just feel like in general it's, it's going to be false. And so like, and so I think that's what's been really interesting is like I've, I've noticed on like, you know, my Facebook feed, sometimes I'll just click something like the, you know, Melania Trump if she's like trending. And I mean, between the, the liberal and conservative, um, people on my Facebook feed, they're just sharing things that are completely from different sources, mm -hmm. completely different, because you can pick and choose what you trust nowadays. And well, so I'm I in think, California, so my Facebook feed is littered with <laughs> New York Times articles. Because, and I don't click on them, that, you're right, because I don't even want to read the New York Times because I already made up my mind about Trump, and I don't need to see another op-ed piece around how fucked up the situation. <laughs> but the people I just who, did the F-bomb, first the, one ever. But the people who, <laughs> All right, I'm the the people on my who new don't show. trust the New York Times for being liberal are the same people that have never trusted the New York Times for always having been liberal. But the New York Times isn't going to publish stuff without fact checking it or without getting verified sources. That's the difference. Yeah. Is that, you know, yeah, the people there probably do have a liberal well, let's slant. talk about the user expectation because this is interesting. So I want to get your take as a younger generation because what I hear are some anecdotal things I see. Hey, I saw it on that blog. A well, I won't say the name of the blog. It's a really well-respected blog for authority and quote fact-checking and whatnot. But just to say it's mediocre at best on, on this content, in my opinion. They say, hey, I saw that on the blog, that blog. And they're like, wow, what do, you, what do you think of it? Well, I don't really know what it means. It's because it was, I just, it was notifying me. Because the blog didn't have credibility in the mind of the user, but it was more like a notification, like, hey, pay attention. So it got their attention. Mm -hmm. And then the users were starting to go to their social network for interaction. Okay, now what does it mean comes to the equation. So the next level of consumption is, hey, I saw that. I need to pay attention to that because I'm interested in that. Now I want to go do some discovery. But you can't just go to Google search and saying, what does that blog post mean? 
because Google search was not built for that kind of um, but you can fact, you can do a lot of your own fact checking I think we're kind of a Wikipedia generation where yeah. we don't immediately just trust everything but we do take information we take it with a grain of salt if something's happening in my okay, neighborhood so if you get that I'll, article I'll go post. on Twitter and I will look for I'll see okay there's a notification of stuff happening on Twitter but I won't immediately believe it I'll just see okay someone said that it's happening now I invest so you going and just on your own progression of discovery right I think a lot of people. You guys do that. agree with that? Yeah. Is that so kind of the I norm? was going to say we're talking a lot about you know journalism now and how how different it is. But I think journalism has always been changing. Like newspapers didn't used to have a sports section. They didn't used to have a lifestyle lifestyle section section. Um, I think there are different social determinants that change the way we tell news. And Twitter has become this phenomena where we can get news really fast and really quick. And I think one thing about our generation, which I don't know if I can speak for our generation as a whole, but we're, I mean, we're not robots in how we digest the news. Sometimes I think we can acknowledge that we often get stuck in our own political echo chambers because when I look at my news feed, most of the news that I see being shared um, are views that reflect my own political opinion. And I think people are becoming more aware of that and trying to search for more objective news and I think that's where maybe this distrust can go somewhere good where our generation will start searching for news sources that give a more holistic view of what's actually happening. So you feel like that's a really idealistic view of it like how people is. can yeah. see the news. I'm trying to be optimistic. I know. Yeah. And, and that's that's good. I just yeah. I really I feel like this election has made it very mm -hmm. clear to me how little that's people true. value facts. How like Trump has just been able to like debate debate speech speech yeah. lie and lie and lie and clearly people npr can fact check all he wants it doesn't matter to somebody who's decided that's a strategy to that's a strategy yeah exactly but it's, it's so unfathomable because how do you then as a journalist try to break through to those people how do you convince yeah. them that the truth is more important or that that an objective way of looking at the situation is more important it's like this I is the cold war of this that. election in my opinion that's why the, the press has been quote ganging up on trump because he is so anti-truth um, yeah, that's on what's some interesting of the, is the comments. idea of being, you know, ganging up on Trump means actively fact-checking, really, is what, but it's yeah. really what it is. But it's that, working because the reason that he's doing not doing well in the polls is because of all the amazing journalism that's been done to fact check him and to call him out. Yeah, I think the calling out was is like uncovering those things that he can't he he said and like shouldn't have said. And yeah. what bothers people the most is that these doesn't he's unrelenting. He keeps on coming. Like yeah. he doesn't care. That's what kind of pisses off everyone. It's like, come on, man, like get over it. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna next segment we're gonna take the junior fellows and on and thank you guys for coming on. Thanks so and much appreciate for appreciate it. And just a final word What's up with this next generation? How would you encapsulate <laughs> your it's generation? Uh, like, yeah. no, I mean, how, like, if you could, like, <laughs> kind of put a, a vibe memes. on it. I think they have too, they're playing too many violent video games. Yeah, listening to that terrible rap, yeah, rap, yeah. Rap, that yeah. rap music. Yeah. <laughs> Do they care more about it, um, you know, whether it's post 9 11 like generation, like my kids? Um, is, is there more interest in doing better, more societal impact stuff? Is I think there we want to understand each other better. I think we mm -hmm. want to spread information around. I think we want to be more empathetic. I think we want to get out of our little bubbles and out of our comfort zones. I think that we are learning more about different types and groups of people and diversifying our experiences. I think the internet is creating a global society. I think it's unearthing some really ugly stuff that then we can have a conversation about. And I think this generation Great. is going to do you're some up really for amazing it. things. Yeah. Do you agree? Right. Yeah. We're up for yeah, it. For it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Silicon Valley Friday show here in Houston. Up next, the Junior Fellows from Palo Alto High School. One of the best journalism programs in the country. They're the only high school represented journalists here. We're excited to have them on. We'll be right back with more after this short break. I remember when I had such a fantastic batting practice, I walked by a couple of sports writers in that era. Hall of Famer, Reggie Jackson. It was like, you were rocking it out I, there. I, I, I kind of hope I didn't leave it out here. Reggie <laughs> Jackson. <laughs> when the game started, right, right, right. I got back in that moment. I got back in what was live, what was now. Goodbye. I went and did a uh, something with ESPN earlier this year with Stephen Curry. They said, Reggie, we want you to come up and watch his practice, his pregame. You know, it was very similar to your batting practice where people come out and watch, etc. And I watched the dribbling exhibition. I watched the going between the legs and the behind the back and the fancy passing, etc. And I watched the shots. And the guy asked me what I thought of the show. And I said, well, it, it's a cool show, but I'm going to see all that tonight. He does all that. He brought I it said, into the game. Yeah, I said, so it, <laughs> it's, a, it's not a show, but that's his game. Mr. October. 
I think our world now with the instant gratification of, of sending out a message or tweeting to someone or some, whatever, certainly in the moment, uh, is about what our youth is and, and who we are today as, as a country, as a, as a universe. Congratulations, Reggie Jackson. You are CUBE alumni. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman. I've been an analyst with Wikibon and a co-host of the Cube since 2010. It's been an exciting journey working with theCUBE. Uh, we get to go out to so many shows, help extract the signal from the noise, uh, interact with such a wide variety of, uh, of, of clientele, both practitioners, thought leaders, the big name uh, industry people, and we've helped some people uh, raise their profiles in there. Uh, especially love working with those practitioners. Uh, we've seen them move their careers forward and move their businesses forward as they take advantage of uh, technologies and practices uh, that they've learned. Talking with us, working with our research people and working with their peers. This is Stu Miniman, thanks for watching theCUBE. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Okay, we're back here at Silicon Valley Friday Show, special taping live here at Grace Hopper Celebration in Houston, Texas, not Friday. So we're doing our Friday show here, and in this segment uh, wrapping up is the two junior fellows from Palo Alto High School, part of the Tech Truth Fellowship, which is a partnership between Silicon Angle Media as well as the Ground Truth Project and the Peter Margulis and Alicia Meese. Welcome to, to the show, appreciate it. You're the editor-in-chief of Campanile, which is the newspaper on campus, and the Verde, which is the magazine, um, well-known, award-winning, Journalism Department, yeah, yeah. Esther Wojcicki, advisor for us as uh, disclosure, but great, great uh, pioneer and certainly mm -hmm. kicking ass in Palo Alto with journalism. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, we're super grateful yeah, for, for having us. Yeah. this opportunity Waj has given us. So journalism, you guys were just talking about the future of journalism. You are the real future <laughs> because you're the, the, the junior fellows, which is really about you're going to be going to college. You've got a lot more to go um, in the journalism and or whatever curriculum you're going to take. Um, how do you guys look at that? Because the traditional curriculum in journalism has been like old school stuff. I mean, you're in a newspaper that's on, you know, trees. Yeah. But it has to translate, now we have, you know, I know Esther's involved in a project right now and changing education and journalism. When you look at the landscape as you guys go forward, what are you looking for? Personally, I am attached to print journalism just because I love in design and Photoshop and stuff like that. So it's definitely hard for me as a student journalist to see that Possibly in the future, like I'll never work in print journalism. But at the same time, like I recognize that there's always a way to put print journalism on the web. Like we can have uh, platforms like Issue, where they actually have flippable uh, magazines online. Well, Flipboard is a great example. Yeah, I mean. yeah. But what is the concept of print journalism that you think can be translated to the web? Because you know, in theory, the web was you can have unlimited amount of text, so there's no scarce resource in terms of you know, lineage on the page, but still people do want fast notifications. So in a way, you do have a requirement to keep it short yeah. and, and or right to the point. I think, uh, as Alicia said, yeah, print media is definitely antiquated. It's kind of dying out for sure. So we're going to be seeing a lot more online journalism. And I think that sort of online journalism is shorter and snappier. It's not as long form as stuff you'd see in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. So people are going to change their writing style around a little bit to be more quick and more readable, especially when you're competing with mediums like video for news. That's kind of, that's the direction that people have to move in in the future. Yeah, that's been the direction that our um, journalism department has been moving in. Yeah. <coughs> both um, both Campy and Verde have been making videos. Recently a video that Verde made about our cover story reached 5,000 views, so it's way more effective. Was that the one, the Holocaust one? Yeah, it that was. That was phenomenal. Uh, yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, it was about the third Audio needs some work, but that's okay. We'll get help, we can help <laughs> oh, you guys well, with that. You can help us with that. Yeah. No, but I mean, uh, you guys are out doing reporting. You guys are natives. You guys are internet natives. You've seen, it's all out there. I mean, yeah. you've probably yeah. seen hate. You've seen a lot of the, the sex talk, all that kind of stuff out there. You're not seeing like a little commentary here and there. It's not on national TVs. I mean, I mean it certainly can be offensive, but it's not new mm -hmm. to this new generation. Mm -hmm. How do you guys go out there and, and deal with that? Do you find it offensive and what do you think should be out there for tooling to make it either manageable or you just kind of blow past it? What's your thoughts on this whole new offensive language out there? I mean, this election is definitely one for the books. There's such intense polarization. And I think, yeah, the internet's exacerbating that, unfortunately. You've got all these forums like Reddit where people are expressing these 
deep, either hard left or hard right, I guess you could call it. People say, ah, it's Reddit, it's a bunch of people talking, but it actually could be interesting sure. input to a story. Mm -hmm. Why are people doing this? And now we have full measurement yeah. of everything. On a different, on a kind of slightly different note, like as internet natives, like you said, I've actually become a little desensitized to it, you know? Yeah. Like I don't really, when people say terrible, terrible things about political leaders or whatever, um, it's like actually really not that big of a deal for me because I've grown up in an age where it's like very, it's very, I intense. guess. It's intense, intense, but it's also, offensive. It's, a, yeah. it's normal to have strong political views. And I've been kind of like dealing with that lately because I've I've noticed that I've leaned more to the more to the middle, like as this election has gone by, just because of the rhetoric on both sides. Yeah. And I we just plug in uh, Virginia Heffernan's book, who I who I love. She's amazing. I've interviewed her. She wrote a book called Art and, and Magic, talking about the internet. I would add to that, magic, art, magic, and madness, because there's some madness going on. But her whole thesis is, the internet is art. Art can be angry, art can be great, and there's also some magical things going on, connecting people together. So you're, in it, you're living in the generation of maybe it's you know, the Instagram 1.0, Snapchat 1.0, where you know, you're seeing stuff and you're hearing unfiltered, in the moment, mm -hmm. avatar-based programming. Yeah. People are hiding behind their online avatar, yeah. but yet it's not, on, not, on, not an avatar anymore, it's their real person. It's their social identity, the digital yeah. footprints, whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah, anonymity on the internet is something that, I don't, you know, I kind of have to Yik Yak when it's going out of business, you know, Yik Yak, you know, that site. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. It's just, I don't know, I don't know if you can really spew hate while under this kind of face of, this like gray, gray gravatar kind of thing, right? Um, I actually like recently got into an argument with my foreign policy teacher. He said, uh, like, the internet is making everyone dumber. And yeah. I was like, no, it's not. No, it's just giving a, a space for people to be dumb on, you know? So I guess that's my opinion on it. Well, you, you, there should be a collective intelligence. We're here at the Grace Hopper talking about computer science. If you think about it, in theory, it should be a collectively intelligent internet, right? I mean, yeah. if you're synthesizing out and using the data, you, as a reporter, you'd be like, okay, now you have no access to data, more access to sources. The question is, what is the trustworthy data? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where the an an enemy this problem comes in. Yeah. yeah, there are so many users, though, that's the issue, and you don't know the educational level of each one. You can have some 12-year-old kid and some grad student arguing on the same forum, which is great. You know, it's promoting free speech and all, but at the same time... You have no time, context if yeah, you don't know exactly. the guy's a 12-year-old. Yeah. There's no credibility for the source that you can quote. What's the biggest thing about the, the current establishment in terms of journalism and just society in general that you think um, technology and reporting and data could um, benefit from making some changes. What would you think? Would like, just some comments. Just what's your thoughts? Yeah. What's uh, wrong with? I'll grab this one. I mean, there's so much inherent bias in journalism, and there's always been. And it's really important to find an unbiased source, which is kind of idealistic. It's difficult to do that, but if we can somehow use data and the internet to gear ourselves more towards the center. Uh, and and find that find that ideal news source. The New York Times is way left. The Wall Street Journal is way right. So I read both to try to <laughs> like compromise a it's little bit. It's just like fun. It's a fun, you know, intoxicating yeah, situation. Yeah. <laughs> Have a little bit of this. Yeah, you're, hit that you're and quit right. that. Yeah. Go there. You know. So yeah. Th so that's the goal, I think, for journalists. Um, yeah, I do the same thing with that, and also CNN and Fox. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Switching both channels. Who do you trust? That's the question. So the question is, is data? Facts and NPR. We talk about the NPR mm -hmm. fact-checking thing as a phenomenon, innovation, yeah. real time online. Just like here's the facts annotated in. I mean, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. If you can crowdsource that. Yeah. All right. So your observations here at Grace Hopper. What's your thoughts so far? Uh, amazing conference. Met so many cool people. We're actually writing a story on the daycare center in the um, Hilton Hotel just yeah. to kind of explore working mom and dad culture. Peter, thoughts? Coolest yeah, thing you've seen? Best terrific. story? I mean, everyone here is great. It'd be cool to get the camera around and show all these hundreds of booths. Um, really bright people. We did a little verbatim thing that you guys can check out on SiliconANGLE. It's just getting the perspectives of a number of people. We got a student, we got a couple of recruiters, and we got, I think, an engineer or two. So. Yeah. Awesome. It's well, thanks stuff. so much for Thank being you, part Robert. of the thanks fellowship. Great, great to have you on the program. This is the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Thanks for listening and see you next week.